Welcome everybody and thank you for joining this presentation about Akira, the Linux design tool. In this presentation, I'm going to go through uh, the major reasons or the most important reasons why I decided to start Akira, uh, what problems I'm trying to solve with an application like Akira, how it compares to other applications, and then we're going to do um, a little demo to show you the most important features and uh, what we are looking for and uh, all the future um, projects and expectations in terms of timeline or uh, releases and all the good stuff. So let's get started. First of all, who the hell am I? Uh, that's a very uh, good question if you have it. Uh, my name is Alessandro, I'm Italian, I love pizza and I hate soccer. That should tell you everything that you need to know about me, but in general I've been a user interface and user experience designer for most of my life. I, designed, I, I started when I was... I don't know, 17, 18, doing web design. At the time, it was called still Webmaster, so I'm kind of old. Um, I've also been a full stack developer for more than 10 years, going from uh, front end to back end to DevOps to release engineering uh, and all the other good stuff. So I have a pretty good understanding on the full stack in terms of web development. Uh, I'm currently the lead UX architect at Thunderbird. So if you don't like something about Thunderbird it's mostly not my fault because I started recently but we're trying to make it better and I'm a free and open source software lover and user that's a very important to me that I'm not just an advocate of a uh, false application but also I use it every day I'm run Linux on my daily drive I code on Linux I design on Linux and I just have Linux machines around as my primary uh, computers Little disclaimer for this presentation, all opinions are mine and are not meant to offend or criticize the work of anyone. Uh, throughout this presentation, I'm going to reference other uh, open source applications that they do things in a certain way that I don't agree with. It's not to throw uh, shade at them, it's not to offend whoever built this, it's just a, a technical analysis of what works and what doesn't. Just think of me as the guy that in a meeting usually asks always all the time, is there a better way to do this? Because I'm the kind of guy trying to improve things the way we do it. Uh, what is Akira? What is it? So Akira can be summarized in a simple sentence, which is a 2D vector graphical application for user interface and user experience design. As usual, this sentence can say everything or says nothing at the same time, but uh, throughout the years I've been trying to build Akira and trying to explain what Akira is, I found it uh, easier to list what Akira is not. So Akira is not definitely a photo retouching or manipulation tool. Uh, it's not like Photoshop, it's not like GIMP, we don't have and we're not planning to add any uh, rasterizing uh, photo manipulation options. It's not a digital painting tool, no brushes, no brush engines, no simulation of uh, brush mixing colors, watercolors, oil painting, all that kind of stuff. No 3D graphics at all. Uh, is not a toolkit or code generator and especially it doesn't aim to be a toolkit code generator. Probably in the future we're gonna have some export the SVG code or export some basic CSS if it makes sense but by default it's just pure visual UI things and especially it's not a print design but also these there's a maybe at the end because Maybe we're going to implement some support for CMYK, we're going to implement support for uh, variable DPIs if you need to print, but it's not the, in the current objective of the near future or the more impending release. Also, most importantly, Akira is not a replacement for the currently available applications out there. We're not trying to compete what currently is available in terms of open source applications. So we're not trying to compete with Kim, with GIMP, Inkscape, Krita, Darktable, and all the other design applications or graphical applications that you see out there um, for Linux, open source application, or even closed source application for Linux. Uh, we are trying to create something new. We're trying to create something different, but most importantly, Akira aims to be the Linux alternative of Sketch, 
Figma, and Adobe XD. These three proprietary applications are the golden standard for user interface and user experience design in large scale companies or in uh, uh, design uh, firms. And those are professional applications. If you've never used any of these three applications, you're going to have a hard time understanding what Akira aims to be. And it's not to criticize you. It's normal if you're not in that environment, professional design for large scale clients, you don't have the need of using these tools because they're very specific tools that completely change the experience and the workflow in which you design things. And they are considered, yes, the golden standard. Uh, another very uh, common question that I get asked all the time, but I also I asked myself at the beginning is why a new app? Why we need to create another app? And this came from the questions also that do you really need a new app to create something, to design something? And the answer is not really. I mean, yes, but also no, because in order to design something, you can absolutely achieve the same result with open source, free and open source software that you can with closed source applications or proprietary applications. And this is a very silly example that I put there, but just to give a very low level example of what I'm talking about, if you need to create a uh, gray rectangle, the gray rectangle is going to pretty much look identical anywhere. It doesn't matter what applications you use. It doesn't matter if it's uh, open source, a proprietary closed source in an Electron app or a native app. It doesn't matter. The result is always the same. But here we're not talking about designing a gray rectangle. We're not talking about doing a simple YouTube banner or a simple splash screen. We're talking about complex design work for clients with a specific workflow. So the problem here is that currently available open source applications are able to exactly create and produce the same result as closed source application, but the speed and efficiency in which you create those things with free and open source software it's rather lacking behind what closed source application professional grade applications offer. So what are these problems? Why uh, applications like GIMP and Inkscape are lacking behind compared to professional applications? And uh, it's there are like a million reasons, but uh, I try to summarize the most glaring and the most important one that I've stumbled upon and I've struggled with throughout all my years of experience. So currently available Linux design applications are not a viable solution for a large collaborative professional environment. They're not widely adopted Adopted. And this is sort of a chicken and egg situation because they're not widely adopted, so design studios don't use them. And because design studios don't use them, they're not widely adopted and they cannot get the market in order to be relevant. And uh, this is more an issue of the design application itself is not challenging enough, is not feature complete enough or not comparable enough to professional design tools. So they're not adopted and will never get adopted. And if you start doing professional design work on a large scale studio or for clients, 99.9% .9 of the time you will find someone that uses Sketch or Figma or Adobe XD. That's it. Uh, they're not compatible with each other. This is also one of the huge problems. If you do a, a very complex design uh, uh, file in GIMP, good luck opening with Inkscape and vice versa. It doesn't exist an easy bridge between all these applications to open each other's files or even import some assets from those files, not even opening the entire file, just importing some assets. They're very disconnected between each other. Uh, the usability and user experience paradigms are extremely outdated on these applications. And and a little example is that if we consider GIMP an uh, alternative to Photoshop, that it's pretty similar to Photoshop and it's trying to emulate Photoshop, and Inkscape as an alternative competitor to Illustrator, imagine that Adobe, the company that owns Photoshop and Illustrator, had to create a completely separate app called Adobe XD because Sketch and Figma were taking market share from them. They were just 
hammering down and uh, uh, grabbing all those designers from using Photoshop and Illustrator and transitioning to their apps because the user experience, the UX and the UI of those tools like Sketch and Figma are way superior when you need to do user interface design. And Adobe itself realizes that and said, okay, instead of updating Photoshop or updating Illustrator, we need to create a completely new app from scratch. That's why GIMP and Illustrator, they lack behind and Sketch and Figma because are completely different interface and completely different workflow and user experience. But most importantly, they lack all the features that are now standard and expected. And there are a million different features, but the most glaring are reusable linked components. You can duplicate an item, like for example, you create a header, you duplicate it 20 times and as a component linked. And then if you change the parent color background, all the other linked components will get updated with the same color background. This is great for quick prototyping, quick visual prototyping, or also multiple design iterations. You're able to keep all your duplicated elements linked and you can go through multiple design iterations without doing manual update all the time. Uh, Built-in version control, a lot of these files, a lot of these tools, they have the ability to restore previously saved a version of your design file, even if you close the application. Multiple artboards. Artboards have been around for almost 10 years now, and there's no trace of artboard support in GIMP and Illustrator, uh, sorry, in GIMP and Inkscape or Krita. And artboards are vital for designers during multiple iterations problem, during um, uh, client work that needs multiple versions of the same file. You don't want to handle 25 different files and then which one was the final one you have everything in one file separated by pages separated by artboards and can be organized properly and many many more there are literally hundreds of features that are so vital and fundamental to today's standards in terms of workflow in terms of being productive and being efficient that are not available and they're really hard to implement on currently available Linux design applications um, another question that I get asked a lot is that why you're not contributing to existing app uh, I tried I originally attempted to fork Inkscape or even GIMP and slowly contribute upstream but unfortunately the uh, source code was too complex and the application was the current status of, of those applications are too disconnected from the primary goal that I'm trying to reach. So the major issues were a massive monolithic code base, which is not a bad thing per se, but it's it, that's one of the reasons why I put my fault in it, because I couldn't understand. It was too complicated to jump into an application that has been around for 20 years or even more and understand the code and change the code and and try to make sense of what i was reading it was too complicated for me so beyond my capabilities um all the things that i wanted to implement the way that the new workflow a new ui a new objective needed to happen in this application was causing drastic code changes that will likely be rejected upstream same thing for the ui changes i cannot literally it's offensive towards the maintainers of Inkscape. I cannot jump in and say the user interface is completely wrong. Let's change it entirely and let's redo it from scratch. It's not, it wouldn't be accepted at all. And also, as I said, the goals and new features uh, of uh, these type of application don't align at all with the current scope of these uh, available Linux applications. So with that, I decided to create Akira and I wanted to uh, keep Akira simple, easy to compile, easy to build and easy to read, especially few dependencies, very simple type of code. And thank God that Elementary stepped in and provided a very simple stack. So this is pretty standard things. We're using GTK, Vala, Elementary OS, the user human interface guidelines with style sheet and icons because they're more, uh, especially at the time, they were the more uh, comprehensive and complete HIG out there. And I didn't need to spend too much time on creating those from scratch. I was relying on professionals that were offering their uh, toolkit in order to build something that it was humanly, humanly comprehensible and usable. And we're using Cairo as a graphics library via the Gucamba's API. We're 
probably getting rid of the Goo Canvas API because they're a bit outdated. But Cairo is a pretty standard library that pretty much there are bindings for Cairo everywhere and it's installed everywhere in every application, in every distribution ever. So it's pretty, pretty standard stuff. What are the key features that we want to implement in Akira? A million and here I just a list of all the most important things but in general what I'm trying to do I literally want to have everything that it's available in sketch figma and Adobe XD inside Akira and that's the thing I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel the wheel is already out there it's pretty smooth and works pretty well I just want to grab that wheel and bring it into Linux it's demo time! So uh, I talked a lot about all the cool things and how the usability and interface it's so crazy and we can do better. Uh, let me show you what I mean. Um, of course the application is currently in alpha so it might crash and it's gonna be uh, very funny if it crashes but nonetheless um, I want to show you all the little uh, nice little features that will improve your life by making you uh, faster and more active and more productive in reaching your goals so first of all uh, the initial interface that you will see when you open Akira for the first time is like this and this doesn't totally respect the uh, human interface guidelines of elementary OS because we have the labels underneath the toolbar buttons the toolbar buttons the toolbar will be populated with a lot of buttons so it's gonna get pretty busy and how many times you spent looking at the uh, toolbar uh, to the side of GIMP or Photoshop and waiting for a rollover and say, uh, what is this? I don't know. I don't understand what is this. Uh, oh, this is a group or ungroup or this is up or down. What, what does it do? Or union. Okay. No. Why? The first time that you step into an application that are, has a lot of icons, most of the times the iconography is not super clear. We're trying to fix that thanks also to elementary, but there's no way that one icon will be universally understood by everyone. So there's an aid with the little um, text label underneath the button. Of course, after you get acquainted, you can change the interface, you can remove the label buttons, you can also uh, convert and use um, symbolic icons if you don't want high colors icons that can distract you from your design but in my opinion this is very good and i like it <laughs> so let's say for example we create a rectangle we create a rectangle we have our little gray rectangle first of all the manipulation of this item uh, if i rotate this item and i shrink it from the size of course it respects the local uh, coordinates of this item and it follows the local coordinates. If I deselect it and select it again, the rotation of the selection is remembered. It doesn't get reset to the regular bounding boxes like like for example it happens on Inkscape and you can still resize it by its all local coordinates. Instead on Inkscape it just reset it to the bounding box and you end up having something like squishing it and skew it to the side is not very optimal so we maintain this um, also if you notice to the side if you don't select anything the panel is disabled all the options are hidden because that's something very important the user interface should update to show the user what it can do at that time and what cannot do so if you don't have anything selected and you're not interacting with anything we don't need to show you that you can actually click on reorder up and down or uh, boolean operations or you can change the opacity because you don't have it in selected uh, so if we uh, check if we select it again now we have a bunch of options for example the border radius we can control it and shrink it we can change the color of the item uh, we can change the opacity we can add a border uh, we can put uh, like a green border uh, I don't know, 27 pixel. If I create an ellipse or a circle, you see we kind of have the same options here. Uh, the panel is enabled, the opacity we have, it, we have the fields, but the border radius is nowhere to be found because of course uh, an ellipse or a circle doesn't need to have the border radius option. So the UI is smart enough to understand that, okay, this item, this component doesn't have the border radius 
attribute, the border radius component, don't show that panel because that panel is just useless. Another thing that we focused a lot was the ability to quickly select your uh, shape, the shape that you needed to select at that time. So for example, this is a pretty absurd um, example, but that might happen. You have something like this, right? You have uh, hundreds of these different shapes that are all uh, squished together and then you have an ellipse with the same exact color and you put the ellipse on top. And now you need to select the ellipse. Uh, good luck in trying to find it what it is. But if you notice here, when you go and roll over on an item to the side to layer your panel, we hover also the corresponding layer. And this option works also the other way. If you select or you go and roll over on an item on a layer, look what happens on the canvas. The layer matches of course the binded canvas item and the item gets alighted so you need to select that circle select that circle and you can drag it and put it out it's pretty straightforward uh, you also have you as you notice we have some smart snapping here that recognize all your uh, sections so if you have something like this this situation you want to central line it it recognizes the most adjacent uh, close by item and snap it to its edges it recognizes also the center alignment the left and right alignment or complete like total center of course you're in this situation you're interacting with this so we automatically kind of ignore that you don't want to interact with this mess of item because it's not necessary it's not useful right now if you get closer you can interact with them of course but uh, the UI, as I said, it's trying to be smart and trying to help you with what you need. Another thing is here, for example, we have a bunch of colors. Uh, here we also collect some global colors if you want. So I uh, color these with uh, green. Okay, let's say that you're doing some design and you have these green element and then your boss comes in and says, I want these green element and all the green elements I want to have uh, a blue instead of a green but you spend so much time in finding that perfect green color that you don't want to just simply override it because maybe you override it you save it you close the file and after two weeks your boss says hey instead of that blue that i told you just go back to that green but that green is lost unless you save an item with that green in your file just to remember what type of color. Here in Akira we have the option to have multiple colors. So you can enable another color, for example, let's say once this type of bluish color. And we want to enable another one. Uh, let's put these like purple. So you can say, how does it look? Does it look better in purple, in blue or in green? Ah, let's do purple. Uh, why don't we mix color? Okay, let's put blue and yellow and then change the opacity of the yellow and see what type of color we comes out. Okay, so with this orangey and purple comes out uh, pink-ish color, salmon color. We got a salmon color and these are two mixed together. So we have the ability to have multiple colors like a sort of an infinite stack of fields and borders in order to experiment and test all the options that we want without losing previous colors these are going to be uh, maintained and if you don't need them you can just hide them but the item will remember that they're still there but they're just hidden so you can re-enable them and if you don't really need them you can just delete them and it's fine and you keep what you need but of course we also keep global colors colors we're going to have an option to have per document color a sort of like local gpl library that says everything uh, another important things in terms of the ui for example uh, actually let me uh, launch another file so it's easier another window so for example we have uh, three items one two and another rectangle like here and let's put it at this green so and these items are one after another, right? The rectangle is the first one, ellipse at the center, and the last rectangle is the bottom. So if I select the last rectangle, you see here the move to top, bottom, the reordering of the Z index of these items change dynamically. So you can put it up, you can move it to the top, but you cannot move it down or to the bottom because this item is already to the bottom. 
if I move it up and I put it all the way to the top, now it's at the top, so you can move it down or push it all the way to the bottom, but not to the top because it's already at the top. This is one very important thing in terms of the UI. The UI shows you what you can click and you cannot in order to avoid distractions. How many times in Inkscape you change the color in the color palette, then you realize you didn't select the actual item that you wanted to change the color, so you select that item and you lost the color that you just defined. This doesn't happen here because we know like you cannot interact with UI elements if you don't have anything selected. Another feature that we implemented is the artboards. Artboards are very important for quick prototyping. So an artboard, uh, for example, if you have uh, uh, yeah, you can drag things inside and the items that are inside are dynamically masked by the artboard. It's like a more smart group that you can move around and you can experiment with things. You can have multiple artboards. You can do a, a web design uh, file or a, a website design with homepage, the about page, the contact page, the whatever, all the pages just separated into artboards one after another and you can zoom in and zoom out and organize all the things that you want uh, without needing to have multiple files or groups that they interfere with each other if you want to see something slightly different you can use our boards another thing that we have here is the export tool exporting something very quickly and seeing what it's going to look like and how much it's going to wait before exporting is very important so if you export the current selection we select we identify what you're selecting so you don't need to create a slice you don't need to uh, resize your file you just can select something and say export what I'm selecting I don't need to create multiple variation of things and here by default we are in this situation where we show the size of the final file the exported and we show also the file weight but you have a little bit of control you can define transparency if you want a transparent file you can define type of options where to put it but also you can resize it so you can scale it twice if you want for high dpi you can simulate a high dpi by doubling up your export or you can export it four times for like a 5k 8k monitor uh, and we are gonna tell you how big is gonna be the actual uh, dimension and the file weight and you can increase the compression and this is a preview this is the actual export preview you're seeing here so you can also check in real time the quality of what type of file you're exporting another thing for example if i save this file we save files uh we did dot akira extension so test one dot akira is going to be saved if we open that file and if we check it in uh, the documents we have test one dot akira if i reveal the hidden files you will see here we have a folder with a uh, tilde lock it's a hidden folder that has the same name of the file that you have open in this folder it's basically the akira file is a zip file a compressed file that handles everything and has built in a github local github repository that every time you save it will create a separated commit with what you saved because all your canvas with all your items is just a simple text json file with all the information all the attributes you have an artboard you have the artboard one what type of components you have the second artboard you have the item which is a rectangle with all the attributes and whatever so it's just pure text that we can also compress the json files and it's going to be super lightweight and being just text saved we're not handling um complicated code or proprietary code is just plain open json with very simply readable attributes we can save that as a commit inside your akira zipped file that you don't know it's a zip file but it is a zip file uh, this will give you the flexibility to go back in time uh, scroll visually the different uh, commit in the commit history we're gonna save a screenshot of the current canvas whenever you save so you have a visual representation of your uh, commit uh, at that point in time and you can revert it back to what you need uh, there are other 
a million different things like you can of course resize from the center you can resize locked uh you can flip it you can rotate it you can control the opacity uh we have other options here import images there are some very good options here to control the snapping of the canvas the default type of shapes if you want to create always a shape with a purple and a border of six seven pixels this is the default so it doesn't matter what you create always will respect the default and you can control that so lots of options this is just an alpha state so a lot of things are missing but we're working hard to deliver a first usable beta that it's going to be almost ready for production or partially ready for production so uh yeah this is very exciting and to conclude, of course, if you're interested in the development of Kira, you can follow us on GitHub. We use GitHub for everything. We have the discussions to discuss new features. Even if you're not a developer, you can check and you can participate as a designer because we use the discussions to visually prototype the features that we want to implement. If we want to uh, change something, improve something. Uh, or you can follow us on social media. Of course, we are on Twitter, on Fostodon. And if you're so inclined, you can donate to the project via LibraPay or Patreon. But yeah, thank you so much for watching and I hope you will follow and use Akira whenever it's going to be released. <laughs> thank you. Welcome. All right. Now, joining us for a live Q&A is Alex and co-founder Cassidy. Gentlemen, that was a great talk and I know we got some questions that came in. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank thanks you for, for having me. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks for joining us, Alex. Um, <laughs> Thank yeah, we so had much. some great questions from the chat and uh, also just had some questions when I was watching your talk that I had um, for you. Uh, for let's Starting off, you know, what about elementary OS specifically made you choose it as the platform for Akira? Mm. Uh, yeah, I touched upon these reasons a little bit in the presentation, but overall, there are multiple reasons. The most glaring one are I have a web design and web development background, so I never did properly native applications and i was looking at a stack that it was the most complete possible in order to start and 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 be quicker uh because i wanted to focus on the actual usability and on the actual uh implementation of the code i didn't want to spend time in i need to design icons i need to design a proper ui that respects the operating system that i want to develop for and elementary us provided the most easily comprehensible stack for me. Like I literally learned how to build, how to start and building in a week with Vala and GTK and the elementary US uh, human interface guideline. It was perfect. Awesome, yeah. And now with um, technologies like Flatpak and especially with App Center for Everyone, um, it's easier than ever to target elementary OS but distribute on other platforms as you see exactly. fit as well. So that's kind of exciting to see an awesome app like Akira um, there. Now, I know we were chatting a bit um, earlier about some upcoming fill features. Um, can you share just some, some of the more examples there, um, the layering, the different fills? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was one of the many, many features they always loved about Sketch and Figma, the ability to add multiple fields or multiple color borders on the same shape and hide or remove which one I didn't want to use. Uh, in the future, we're going to also add the ability to uh, switch the type of field. So you will have a linear gradient or radial gradient or even an image. So you can literally have a, like a background uh, color, like a flat color. And on top, you can have a dark overlay gradient with a 50% opacity. And on top of that, you can also have an image with a 20% opacity. So you can create some sort of like easily quick prototype, the usual like headers that you see in website with an image that is a little bit of opacity. You don't need to add an image and mask it to the shape that you want to mask it and then reduce the opacity. Everything it's in the fields color panel of that same shape. So it's easily manageable. Yeah, yeah, it seems like such a simple feature, but um, it makes it really powerful to, to mm -hmm. prototype different things, and, and yeah. that's really cool. It's, it's yeah. not, unfortunately, it should be simple. It's not because SVG, the SVG coding standards, they don't have like, uh, it doesn't have that type of standards accepted. So it needs to be something custom. And in the code, we are calculating all the mixing. We're mixing colors all, uh, in order to just apply a simple color to the single shape. It's mm -hmm. going to be interesting to see how we're going to manage it with images, but it's doable. 
Yeah. So speaking of things that are nice and simple for users, but complex to implement, um, <laughs> Colin had a question. Are there any plans for adding online collaboration features to Akira? Oof. Uh, 100% <laughs> yes. How doable it is, we have no idea, uh, but we will uh, we will try to do it. It's very important to have uh, uh, at least like very basic collaboration in terms of multiple people connecting and leaving comments on the design that you're looking at. Not even interacting with design, but just leaving comments or clicking on things and pointing on things. That's very important. So we're going to try to implement that in the future 100%. That's something that we want to have. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another, I guess, feature feature request maybe here. Carlos asked, could Akira implement the Unsplash API in the future? It would be a great integrated image source. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's one of the many things that we want to implement. Uh, we are going to start implementing some uh, external plugins. So we will have some um, um, bare bone code to show developers how to create plugins for Akira. And one of the, the, the two main plugins that we're planning to implement is the Unsplash API to add images super quickly to a shape or directly in the canvas. And also the, um, uh, the noun project is an icon uh, website uh icon pack like just just an icons gallery that has some great api we're going to implement also that that you can directly import svg icons or uh, load svg icons from that library so we're going to have uh those external apis every time there's something open source and free and easy to use we're going to integrate that to speed up development and design prototype inside akira Awesome. Yeah, that sounds really awesome. Having having yeah. those things built into your tooling can make such a, a difference with tape, saving time. Yeah. Uh, Sean Davis asks, how many people regularly contribute to Akira? Is it a one person show or more? Uh, it really depends. Uh, I would say it's a two to three person show sometimes. Uh, most of the times it's, it's just me. I I'm the one that almost codes every day uh, but we have a couple of other people that are contributing right now and it's very uh, like seasonal sometimes we have a couple of contributors that are very involved every day every week for like two months and then they disappear because life happens uh, so it's 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 hard to quantify but yeah it's an average of two three people kind of yeah. always present yeah makes sense um Stainslaw says, will there be uh, elementary UI assets in Akira? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the many plugins that we wanted to develop is also a um, uh, UI toolkit import. And I'm not talking about the toolkit code, just the UI aspect. So we're going to allow users to literally drag and drop from a library of pre-built, I don't know, a buttons, a header bar, or a granite window or a granite dialog. You can drag it and you have the SVG built there as a composed shape or like a, a component that you, that you can explode and you have all the different elements inside. So yes, absolutely. And we're planning to do that also for the uh, material team or the uh, KDE team or other things. It's just, yeah, we want to implement that type of plugin so users can inject their own uh, UI library and users should be able to just drag and drop it inside the canvas. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Varun Singh asks uh, or says, it's too bright for me. Please tell me there's a dark mode. Uh, yes, there is. Go into the settings interface and check uh, the uh, checkbox uh, toggle dark mode is there. <laughs> there you go. It's already done. Yeah. Um, somebody else, uh, Gaver, says they just had an idea, um, a variable reference for colors of elements. So shapes refer to the color as a variable. And then when you change the variable, um, the referring shapes change. Is that something you've thought about or have plans for? Yes, uh, that's called the design system, is that when you uh, define a color or even a style of a specific text, you assign that you save that type of styling as a unique variable. Then if you update that variable, all the shapes and components and elements that you have in the canvas that use that variable are automatically updated. So yes, that's absolutely in the works and in the uh, roadmap. Um, Micah Ilbury. Hi, Micah, by the way. Oh. Um, great designer who has a talk coming up later. Um, 
says, are there plans to add grids, guides, and rulers to make pixel perfect elements? Yes, uh, grids is already there. You can add a, a global grid to the canvas, uh, but each artboard will allow to create a columns grid. Like you can have a web layout type of columns, responsive columns. You can have rulers. Uh, all this, pretty much all the usual things that uh, design application has is going to happen in Akira, and it's going to be even better to use <laughs> we're gonna try to make it easier and better and more more um scalable uh, and more adaptable to the needs of the designers awesome well, i see more questions coming in in the chat than we have uh, time to answer unfortunately today but um, if you can stick around and answer them in the chat otherwise um sure i'll we'll try find, you know can find another time to answer them but thank you for joining us again alex and um thanks for your excellent talk thank you for having me <laughs> Thank you.